In this video, we'll go over how to implement a Swift UI grid view with 3D model data. When completed, the browse view will display thumbnails for our 3D assets organized by category. Because of the complexity of the browse view, we split up the implementation over two videos. In a previous video, we focused on the code to display the browse view using a Swift UI sheet and a navigation view. In this video, we'll focus on implementing a grid view to display thumbnails of our 3D assets using a Swift UI lazy H grid. Before we get started, this is the hardware and software used in this video. If you are using anything older or newer, you might have to make some adjustments to your code. Now let's get started. We have several action items for this video. First, we have to create a horizontal grid view that will later be populated with thumbnail images. For this step, however, we will populate the grid view with placeholder data. Second, we have to create a model class that will contain relevant properties and methods for our 3D models. And third, we'll update our grid view to use model data. This will allow us to display thumbnails for our 3D models. So without further ado, let's dive into the code. In our browse view file, right below our browse view struct, let's create a new struct called horizontal grid and have it adopt the view protocol. To conform to the view protocol, we'll create a body variable. Let's use Xcode autocomplete to help us along. Inside the body variable, create a vStack and set its alignment to leading. Inside our vStack, we'll add a text view with placeholder text category title. We can use modifiers to style our text view. First, we'll set the font to title2 and make it bold. Second, we'll set the padding on the leading side to 22 points. And finally, we'll set the padding on the top side to 10 points. Next, create a scroll view and set the direction to horizontal and shows indicators to false. Inside the scroll view, we'll create the horizontal grid using a Swift UI lazy H grid. Before adding the lazy H grid inside the scroll view, Create a constant called grid item layout and specify the layout to be one row of items where each item has a fixed height of 150 points. Next, add a lazy H grid inside the scroll view and set the rows to grid item layout and spacing to 30 points. Inside the lazy H grid, we'll create five placeholder items. We'll later update this code to display buttons with the thumbnail images for our 3D assets. As placeholder, we'll use a color object. We'll set the color to secondary system fill. Next, we'll add a frame modifier to set the width and height of the placeholder to 150. And finally, we'll add a corner radius modifier to set the corner radius of the placeholder to 8. We'll also set the horizontal padding for the lazy edge grid to 22 points and the vertical padding to 10. We can now add a horizontal grid to scroll view in browse view struct. Run the app on device to see our intermediate progress. We can see that we now have one horizontal grid with five placeholder items. For the second action item, we have to create a model class that will contain relevant properties and methods for our 3D models. To do so, let's create a new Swift file. Right click on Browse View File and select New File. Select iOS as the platform and Swift File as a template. Click Next. Enter a name for the file. In this case, we'll call it Model. Click Create. Xcode automatically adds Import Foundation. We can remove this line of code. We will, however, import several frameworks. We'll import SwiftUI, RealityKit, and the Combine framework. Next, we'll create an enumeration called Model Category and have it adopt the Case Iterable protocol. By adopting this protocol, Swift exposes a collection of all the cases as an all cases property of the enumeration type. Let's create four categories using four enumeration cases. Table, chair, decor, and light. We'll also create a new variable called label and set the type to string. This variable will return the proper label text for each case using a switch statement. For case.table, return tables. For case.chair, return chairs. For case.decor, return decor. For case.light, return lights. Next, we'll work on our model class. For this class, we'll start off by creating several variables and then we'll work on a custom initializer method. Create a variable called name and set its type to string. Create another variable called category and set its type to model category. Create a third variable called thumbnail and set its type to UI image. Create another variable called model entity and set its type to optional model entity. By setting the type to an optional, this property will either contain a model entity or nil. 
And finally, create a variable called scale compensation and set its type to float. This is a very important property. RealityKit uses meters as its units of measurement. When buying or obtaining third party assets, creators sometimes use different units or scales. To correct for that, we use the scale compensation property. Next, we'll create an initializer for our model class. The initializer will specify several parameters. The first parameter will be a name parameter of type string. The next one will be category with type model category. And finally, a scale compensation parameter of type float. For this parameter, we'll assign a default parameter value of 1. Inside our initializer, we will initialize our properties. Assign the name argument passed into the function to the name property. Assign the category argument to the category property. Next, we'll get the thumbnail using the name of the corresponding model. We have to be careful here. Our UI image constructor returns an optional. In case a thumbnail doesn't exist under the specified name, we'll assign a default image using the nil coalescing operator. Finally, we'll assign the scale compensation argument to the scale compensation property. Notice that we're not initializing our model entity property. We don't need to initialize it up front since it's an optional. Instead, we will load our model entity when the user selects it for placement in the AR view scene. We'll add a to-do command to create a method to asynchronously load our model entity when needed. This method will be implemented in a follow-up video. The final thing we'll do for our models file is to create a new struct called models. This object will contain references to all our models. Keep in mind, in a production app, you'd likely want a more elegant solution to index and organize your 3D models. Inside our model struct, create a new variable called all and set its type to an array of model. We will also initialize this property by assigning it an empty array. Next, we'll work on an initializer for our model struct. This initializer will not have any parameters. Inside this initializer method, we will create our models and add them to the all array. First, we'll work on creating our table models. Create a constant called dining table and assign it a model with name dining underscore table. The category will be dot table and scale compensation will be 0.32 divided by 100. This specified scale compensation argument scales our 3D asset to the appropriate real world scale. Next, create another constant called family table and assign it a model with name family underscore table. The category will be dot table and scale compensation will be 0.32 divided by 100. Append both the dining and family table models to the all array. Next, I'll add all chair models, then the core models, and finally light models. If you'd like to copy the code, feel free to pause the video here. After instantiating the models for each category, make sure to add them to the all array. The final thing we'll do for our model struct is to create a helper method to filter through our all array and obtain every model belonging to a specific category. The function will be called get and will have one parameter called category with a type of model category. The return type of our function will be an array of models. Our function body will be a one liner. We'll use the filter method on our all array and check the category of each element. If there's a match in category, it is added to an array of models returned by the filter method. Now that we are done with our models, we can use that data to populate our grid views. Return to browseview.swift. Right below our browse view struct, create a new struct called models by category grid. We'll have it adopt the view protocol and add a body variable. Before we add views to the body, let's create a new constant called models and use our models constructor to initialize it. Because we want each category of models to vertically stack, we'll add a vStack in our body. We essentially want the children of the vStack to be horizontal grids for each category. Since we have four categories, we will have at most four horizontal grids. If a category doesn't have any models, we won't display its grid. To loop over each model category, we will use SwiftUI's for each view struct. This is not the same as the for each method on Swift sequences. If you'd like to learn more about for each, I'll add a link to a great article on hackingwithswift.com. For each expects a collection of data such as an array and instructions on how to uniquely identify each of the items in the collection. By uniquely identifying each item, SwiftUI can monitor and react to any updates. 
In this case, we'll provide model category all cases as the collection and backslash dot self as the ID. By using backslash dot self, we instruct Swift that each item in the collection is uniquely identified by its own value. As mentioned earlier, we want to display a horizontal grid for a category if the model's array has at least one model with that category. We can use our helper method in our model struct to get all models for a specific category. If models exist for a category, create a horizontal grid. When we originally created our horizontal grid, we used placeholder data. Let's update our horizontal grid to take in actual model data. Create a new variable called title and set its type to string. Create another variable called items and set its type to an array of models. Swift will automatically update the constructor for a horizontal grid to now include a parameter for title and one for items. For title, we'll pass in category.label, and for items, we'll pass in models by category. In the scroll view of our browse view struct, we see a similar error of missing arguments. However, we will remove the horizontal grid and instead replace it with our models by category grid. Back in our horizontal grid, let's replace our placeholder data with model data. We're going to replace the category title string literal in our text view with our title variable. In the lazy age grid, replace the predefined range in for each with zero dot dot less than items dot count. Before we finish up our horizontal grid, let's run the app to see our intermediate progress. We can now see that we have four horizontal grids. Each grid has a number of items corresponding to the number of models with that category. However, there are no thumbnail images, and clicking on an item does nothing. In the remainder of this video, we will fix these issues. Before we create a button with a thumbnail for each model, let's create a separator to draw lines between each horizontal grid. Create a new struct called separator and have it adopt the view protocol. Create a body variable. Add a divider to the body and use the padding modifier to adjust the look of it. The horizontal padding will be set to 20 and the vertical padding will be set to 10. Add our newly created separator above the text view in our horizontal grid vStack. Run the app to see our intermediate progress. That looks much better. The final thing we'll work on in this video will be our item button. This button will display a thumbnail of our model, and when tapped, we'll select the corresponding model for placement. Right below our horizontal grid struct, let's create a new struct called item button. We'll have it adopt the view protocol and add a body variable. Before we add views to the body, let's create two new constants. The first constant will be called model and will be of type model. The second constant will be called action and will be a closure. Inside our body, we'll create a button. I like to create a skeleton structure for our button before populating the action and the label blocks. For our button action, we'll call our action constant. For our button label, we'll display a model thumbnail. We can do so using an image view. We'll use the constructor that takes in a UI kit UI images argument and pass in model.thumbnail. We can of course use modifiers to style our thumbnail. The first modifier will be dot resizable. This allows us to resize the image. The second modifier will be dot frame with a height of 150. Next, we'll use the aspect ratio modifier and set the aspect ratio to one over one and the content mode to fit. By setting the aspect ratio to one over one, we're essentially saying constrain the width and height such that they are equal. In essence, we're enforcing a square aspect ratio. Next, we'll use the background modifier and set it to a color, specifically UI color dot secondary system fill. And finally, we'll use the corner radius modifier to give our thumbnail a corner radius of eight. Now that our item button is complete, we can return to our lazy age grid in our horizontal grid struct. We can now remove the color element that was used as a placeholder item. Create a new consonant for each called model and set it to items index. This will assign the current model to our model constant. Next, let's add our item button. We can pass in our model constant as our first argument. Press tab to select the action parameter and then press enter. We can now write code to pass in as a closure to our item button. In this video, we won't finalize the code for item button, but instead we'll add some to-do items. First, we'll add a to-do item to call our model method to asynchronously load the model entity. Second, we'll add another to-do item to select our model for placement. These to-do items will be covered in a follow-up video. 
Next, we'll add a print statement saying, Browse view, selected model name for placement. In this case, we're using string interpolation to fill in the model name in the string literal. And last, but certainly not least, we need to dismiss our browse view when the user taps on an item. As you might recall, we have a state variable called show browse, which determines whether to show or hide the browse view. Since our browse view struct already has a binding property to show browse, we'll have to create a link to our horizontal grid. Let's copy paste the binding property line from browse view into horizontal grid. We'll also need to paste it into models by category grid. In our item button closure, set the show browse boolean property to false. As we can see, our code has two errors. These errors popped up because our constructors have changed. Use autofix to update our horizontal grid constructor call. We're going to pass along the binding as an argument to our horizontal grid constructor by prefixing the property name show browse with a dollar sign. Again, use autofix to update our models by category grid constructor call. We can pass along the binding using the dollar sign and property name. We've now completed all action items for this video. Run the app to see our browse view in action. As you can see, our model thumbnails are now displayed. When we tap on an item, the console displays which item has been selected for placement. And that's it for this video.